PCR helps prevent the formation of nonspecific products when you're trying to make lots of copies of a specific region of DNA using PCR. It works by preventing the DNA copier DNA polymerase from getting started before you say it's go time. So here's more on how it works as well as what those like nonspecific products even are and how they form and how you can avoid them. Much more on how PCR works in other posts, but the thing we're going to focus on today is the idea of having these primers bind specifically or nonspecifically and the effect of temperature on whether or not they're going to be binding specifically or nonspecifically. So what do I mean by specific or nonspecific? So specific would be binding exactly where you want it to bind and nowhere else. So typically when you're designing these primers, you want need to make sure that it's going to not bind to any other sequences on your template. So on the DNA you're trying to copy, you want to make sure that the primer is only going to bind in one place. And you can use tools like BLAST to check for other binding matches. And remember that if you are, say, um, trying to amplify a plasmid that was grown in bacteria, you also, or bacteria and you're doing like colony PCR, you want to make sure that your primers aren't going to bind somewhere in the bacterial DNA. Um, so you want to make sure it binds only where you want it to. Um, and so the way that you can do this is often when you make the primers longer. So um, the longer things are, the more fewer, the less chance there is that they're going to bind something just like by accident, like accidentally match something. Um, so typically, it's just like for a typical PCR, a, piece, a primer might be about 20 nucleotides long. Um, another thing that determines how strong they're going to bind is going to be the um, GC content. So G and C are going to bind more tightly than A and T. Um, and then, so if you have more GCs, you're going to have tighter binding. And when we talk about tighter binding, this is usually going to be reflected in a higher TM. So a melting temperature, um, which is basically the temperature at which like half of it is going to kind of be bound versus unbound. And so at a high, if you have a higher TM, you can go to a higher temperature without it without the strand, without those unbinding. So if you have less specific things, they're going to have a lower TM, they're going to come apart at a higher temperature. Um, so, I mean, like if you're at a higher temperature, they're going to be coming apart. Whereas if you're at, at that higher temperature, but still below the temperature a higher, of a higher, of a more specific product that has a higher TM, well then that higher TM is going to mean that the, that more specific, that tighter binding product is still going to be bound even when those other ones are unbound. Um, and so the way to think about this is think about how it's easier to leave something that you don't like than it is to leave something that you do like. So if you are, say, in the middle of a really, really great movie and then you have to go do something, it's going to take a lot more energy in order to like convince yourself that, yeah, I really need to go get off the couch and go do that thing. Whereas if you don't like the movie that much, then maybe you don't need that energy to get up and go and you're like, yeah, I'm ready. Um, and so basically, if the DNA molecules have enough energy, um, then they can overcome attractions to one another. And so if the tighter they're bound, the more they like each other, the more energy it's going to take in order for them to come apart. Um, and so you can think about it at a lower temperature, they're kind of going to settle for less ideal matches, whereas a higher temperature, they're going to have the energy to go find their soulmate. And it's not really like that, but if you think about the molecules kind of wiggling around, um, they want to be free, but they're kind of like tied together. And so if they're not tied together that tightly, it's not going to take as much energy. And so it's not going to take as much heat for them to come apart. But if they're bound really tightly together, then it's going to take more heat. And so they're going to um, require a higher temperature in order to come apart. And they're going to stay together at a lower temperature. Even if at that lower temperature, the nonspecific things are going to be unbound. And so nonspecific things are typically going to have these lower temperatures because they're often going to have mismatches. Remember, these aren't things that you designed to be this way. Um, these have to kind of match. Um, or if you have regions of your primers that have had regions that match, those are typically going to be smaller regions um, than the full length of a primer that you might design in order to bind to um, your template. The primers, even though they might only have these short stretches that bind, they're going to have the advantage that at the lower temperatures, they're still going to have started off as these single stranded DNA rather than your template strand, which is going to be double stranded and needs to be melted. So it needs to be um, heated up to come apart in order for those primers to bind. Um, 
with the primers themselves, they're going to start off single stranded and so they can bind upon themselves. Um, we can get these like hairpins or you can get them binding to one another. And so these products, if you get like a hairpin, this is going to block the primer from binding where you want it to. And if you get these primers binding to copies of themselves, these primer dimers, you can get these little amplified stretches on my these like primer chimeras. Um, and so these things are going to be favored at a lower temperature because at the lower temperature, they're still free and because they're not going to have the access to those um, better specificity products because those are going to mostly be hidden. Um, and so the primers dimers are going to be a major problem at the lower temperatures, as well as some of the non-specific products that you can get if regions of the DNA are accessible. Um, and so these are problems that we want to avoid and hot start PCR is going to help us avoid that. So if you think about setting up a PCR reaction, especially in the olden days before we had these like um, master mixes where you could buy where everything was kind of like pre-mixed together except for your DNA. Um, and so now you just add this to your DNA and your template and your primers and you're off to go. Um, but even that can take a while. Um, if you have a lot of different things you're trying to set, lots of reactions you're trying to set up, you want to make sure that you're pipetting all the right stuff into all the right tubes. Um, so you want to make sure that you're like taking your time and being focused. But if you take your time um, and your DNA polymerase is starting off working, then you're going to have your reaction starting in the first tube while you're still trying to um, pipette into your last tube. And remember when you're having the reaction start, when you're setting things up, well, that reaction is going to be happening at those lower temperatures where those less specific products are going to be um, able to form. And so we don't want that to happen. We want the DNA polymerase to not be able to be active until we actually have all of the reactions together. We have them in the machine and the machine is at that point in the ECR cycle where we should be getting product formation. So it's in that extension step of the first cycle. Um, so that's when we want the polymerase to be active. And so that's where those heart stop polymerases are designed, um, the chemistry and things are designed so that they become active at that point. So and before, without hot start polymerases, you have to add the polymerase at like the very last minute. Um, and even still, you still, because if you have say 96 well plate and you're adding the polymerase to like each well, and even if you're using a, like a multi-channel, which I'm not exactly sure how you would use with the um, DNA polymerase unless it's part of a master mix, um, you're basically going to have some of the tubes would get the polymerase before the last tubes. And so um, typically you would be doing this like on ice to try to prevent the polymerase from being active. Even at those lower temperatures, you could still have a little polymerase activity, problems like this. And then when you stick your tube in the cycler and the cycler has to get up to the temperature. And then during that time, you can have things start to ramp up. Um, basically, it's not perfect. And so by having the polymerase totally not active until you get the higher temperature, you're able to take your time when you're setting up your reaction, you're able to set up your reactions at room temperature without having to worry about things starting, um, without having to, um, do anything special and then your reaction hopefully won't start until you're ready and hopefully then you're going to be getting the specific products and you're not going to have those non-specific products that got that head start and being react and being copied and therefore started getting copied and taking up a lot of the copying machinery as well as um, and generating a lot of non-specific products that then you have to deal with later on. Um, and so a little more about how these different methods work. So some of them hide the polymerase and some of them hide things that the polymerase needs. So a lot of the methods rely on using antibodies to actually bind to the polymerase and inactivate it. So antibodies are little proteins that recognize other things. Um, we often think about antibodies in the context of immunity because antibodies can be made by our immune system. Um, basically these B cells, these immune cells mix and match different parts of um, genes to make different antibody proteins. Um, and then the proteins just, they do this randomly. And then the ones that happen to stick to things um, that are foreign and not stick to things that are your own bodies, um, these get selected for and so you make more of them. Um, and so in the lab, um, scientists can get antibodies to be made against all sorts of different things. I and mean, you can get antibodies made against DNA polymerase. Um, and these antibodies, if they bind to a place in the polymerase that are going to inactivate it, well, now the polymerase can't do its thing. Um, and these antibodies, they're going to these little proteins, they're not as hardy as the DNA. And so the DNA, we can get it up to those really high temperatures and the DNA strands will come apart. So we say they denature 
but the strands are still staying strands and they're still able to stick back together and do all this stuff. Whereas if we heat up the protein, we heat up these antibodies now, they actually, when they denature, they can't fold back as e they can't fold back up. Um, and so these are like permanently deformed. Um, this is going to make them fall off and so the polymerase can start working. So that's one method. Um, another method actually hides the polymerase, such as sequestering it in wax beads. So you kind of just hide it in these wax and then when the wax gets hot, it melts up and releases it. Other methods um, use things like blocking the DNTP, so blocking the, the nucleotides. So these DNTPs, so these DNA letters, they get added together from the five prime to a three prime, or um, the three prime, the free, you have a free three prime of the one of the growing chain, and then the free five prime, so these phosphate groups of the incoming nucleotide, um, and those are going to link together. And so you need this free three prime OH in order for this reaction to occur. Some of these um, hot start PCRs use like hot start DNTPs. Um, and so what these do is they actually block that 3 prime OH with some sort of thermal labile protecting group. So thermal labile basically means that it's heat sensitive and it's going to um, break at a higher temperature. And so at a higher temperature, that, that protecting group, so this thing that's blocking the OH is going to fall off and you're going to get that um, that OH that can then serve as a linkage on point. Um, and so this is a way where you're hiding the letters um, rather than hiding the polymerase, but you get the same effect. Um, and another method um, actually uses like high um, phosphate. So you get like magnesium phosphate precipitates that are going to dissolve at a higher temperature. Um, because the, the polymerase needs that magnesium in order to work. And so without the magnesium, you hide that magnesium, then it can't get to work. And so these are the, a few different strategies that are used in order to prevent polymerase from getting going until you want it. And so remember that the reason why you want this is because you want only not, you want the most specific products to be formed. You don't want those non-specific products to be forming before the reaction that you want to happen is actually has a chance to happen. Um, and you, um, at the higher temperatures, you're going to be favoring the formation of the more specific products because those less specific um, DNA bound to one another, that's less specifically bound, that's less tightly bound, it's going to be, have a harder time staying stuck at those higher temperatures, whereas those more specific products, um, those more specific interactions where your primer is actually binding to your template where you want it, um, because of the way that you design these so that you have a perfect one-to-one -one matching, no mismatching, um, and unless it's like a mutagenesis, um, but then you have a longer primer. Um, and so typically these primers are going to be longer and they have more of these specific interactions. They're going to have these higher melting temperatures. They're going to be able to stand the higher temperatures. Um, and at those higher temperatures, the less specific things, the shorter pieces, the things with larger mix matches, those aren't going to be bound to, um, they're not going to be able to stay bound because um, they have enough energy to break free from those weaker interactions. So by making it so that your reaction doesn't start until you get to those higher temperatures, you're able to prevent the formation of products from those non-specific um, primer bindings, primer binding events or other binding events. Um, and so hot start PCR is a way to prevent the reaction from happening before you want it so that you only get the products that you want, hopefully. Um, so I hope that helps you understand.